Good. Welcome to the third session of our series on living our faith life today. Um, we've already considered in the first session um, the command of the Lord to love God and love neighbour. And in the second section, ses session was about prayer, prayer in general, and then the acts of prayer that contribute to the life of prayer. And today we're going to talk about the life of virtue, the transformation of our life. And um, there is a handout there, but the handout is not necessary to listen to the conference, and the handout is on the parish website as well for those that are watching. One of the quotes that I already mentioned in our talks is that the Christian life is like an arch. That in an arch you've got the sides of the arch and the keystone of the arch that um, keeps the arch up. And we said that the keystone of the arch um, was prayer and the sides of the arch um, was the education or the formation um, of our life. In the language of the, of the tradition it was rooting out the vices and um, practicing the virtues. So we've looked at prayer, and now we're looking at the transformation of our life. St. Therese of Avila uh, said on one occasion that if you try to go to God simply by contemplation alone, you'll end up as a spiritual dwarf. In other words, you need the life of virtue as well. So really that's what we're reflecting on today. And I want to say that it's equally as important uh, as the act of prayer. Uh, we were so conscious of, if we said we didn't pray during the day, well, that would seem very bad. But if we didn't attempt to transform our life during the day, it's equally as bad, because both of those things are necessary uh, if we're going to live our life of, as disciples of Jesus to the full. So I'd like to talk initially about our human condition and begin with St. Paul. We all know those quotes of St. Paul, where he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, they're the very things that I do. And he has a couple of quotes that I'd like to share which fill out what he's saying there. He says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, and making me captive to the members of another law, at, at um, a law of sin which dwells in my members. So he's pointing to that division there, which he talks about in terms of flesh and spirit. Another quote, live by the spirit, I say, uh, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. So the flesh here, is really pointed to that self-centered dimension um, of our life. Our nature was created for God. It was created for virtue, to come to a deeper intimacy with God. But because of sin, our nature has been um, disoriented. And what we find is that instead of having the default of God, we tend to find the default as the inordinate self love. I stress inordinate because we're talking about a self-centeredness, which is really not a very positive thing. I'd like to read a rather longer quote um, about um, our own situation. The principal defect of the will is self-love or inordinate uh, love of self, which forgets the love due to God and that which we should have for our neighbour. That's the very contrary of our initial talk, that we are to love God and to love our neighbour. Self-will which is born of self-love or egoism, and which is defined as that which is not conformed to the will of God, is the source of every sin. It is like a cancer of the will, which ravages it, ravages it more and more, whereas sanctifying grace should be in it like a strong root, which buries itself ever deeper in the soil, in order to draw therefrom there nourishing secretions and transforms them into a fruitful life. So the point being made is that it's of our very nature to be part of that um, tension. And in the midst of this tension, we have our free will, that we are able to choose the flesh or we are able to choose 
um, the spirit. And in a sense, one of the spiritual fathers said that we are our own parents in the spiritual life. In other words, the invitation from the Lord is there, the grace is there, but we are the ones who choose just how much we open our hearts um, to the grace that has come to us. So it's important to realise that we need to educate our will. It's the formation of the will that is basically uh, the important thing. And this is what's taking place within us. I think sometimes pe people criticise what we're doing here and saying, well, it's all about within. What about all those important social issues that are out there? Well, they are important too. But really, it's what is in our heart that actually prompts us to reach out and do those things. I mentioned in the earlier talk that Christian love is not being drawn to things, it's being urged to things. Not just being drawn because you like it or because you think you should do it, but rather it's a love that is urging one uh, to reach out. And that's why it's important that we look at the interior, that it's easy to be the external thing. If you remember the, the um, commandments of the church we used to have of uh, making your Easter duty each year and coming to Mass on Sunday, being married before the parish priest, all of those were external things and they were good things to do. But they were meant to be done from the heart. And it's the fact that they weren't done from the heart very often which I think has caused a lot of people um, to give up their faith, that they weren't deeply rooted. And so when difficult times came along, they actually uh, found it difficult to remain. So it's the formation of that will put in the, in the middle of that situation that we really need to look at. A few years ago, um, I was trying to look for a, a substitute word for holiness. And holiness is a good Christian word, but it gets to be used so much that it tends to lose something of its normal meaning. And the word that I came up to in terms of, um, of, of, of uh, an alternate word uh, was the word character. We talk about a person of good character. In other words, a good person. And basically that person is a person that is what we might call inclined more to the spirit than more to the flesh. I came across a good definition of character we said that it was understanding and caring about and acting out of core ethical values. In other words, that's the person who had values, understood them, and actually did them. But I think if we're going to talk about um, a Christian or Catholic character, well, it is the same, understanding, caring about, and acting, but acting out of our relationship with Jesus. If we're just working out of values, well, it's something within ourselves and it's a good thing to do. But I, I think when we're talking about the life of virtue, we're talking about the life that we share with the Lord. And I think the important thing is to recognise it's what happens within the framework of our relationship with the Lord um, that is uh, the key thing. I came across another interesting definition of spirituality from a, an American theologian. That spirituality is the experience <coughs> of constantly striving to integrate one's life in terms not of isolation uh, or self-absorption, but of self-transcendence towards the ultimate value one uh, perceives. And notice again, it's working around uh, a value. But I think if we look at Christian spirituality, most of that definition remains the same. It is the experience of constantly striving to integrate our life in terms of the relationship that we have with Jesus. So there's a human dimension in what we're talking about here, the person that develops a good character, but there's also a relational character that is important. So what we're dealing with is we call it the life of virtue, but it's leaning to the spirit rather than uh, to the flesh. And what we're trying to do is always uh, to do the will of God. The Lord said, it's not those that say, Lord, Lord, that will enter the kingdom, but those who do the will of my Father. And to do the will of the Father, to align our will with the will of God, we need to engage in that conflict that is there um, within us. And I'd like to suggest that that's really where the Christian life is. If we look at the example of marriage, lots of values in marriage, certainly, but it's the relationship that is important 
Now, there's family obligations and doing other things, but really it's that relationship there that is the framework within which everything else is done. And I think that's what we uh, need to recognise, um, that um, this is what we're trying to do when we talk about living the life of virtue. Now, we call that um, life within um, the interior life. And it's that interior life that we need um, to develop. Let me give you a definition of it. The interior life, in a spiritual sense, refers to that conflict in the heart of the person. So we're talking about what's in the heart. And Augustine says that we are what we are in the heart. We know from looking in society that there are many people who look very good. Suddenly we find out that really they're not quite as good as they look. In other words, in their heart, they were something different. And that's something that, um, that we can recognise, that throughout our life um, we haven't always expressed correctly, internally, externally, what was really um, in our heart. So it goes on um, that the interior life um, is the heart of a person who works with their disordered natural inclination, that's what we've talked about, in order to regulate them and endeavours to develop their heart so that in all things it judges and directs all its actions to the glory of God. So really that's what we're trying to do in taking um, in, in, a, in, a, in working with that tension that was in us so that we can um, make everything that we do something that we give to God. The interior life is developing in our heart a close relationship with Jesus to whom we constantly turn our heart and to whom we find the strength to direct all that we do to the glory of God so that our active works really have their beginning and their end in our heart and they actually find their meaning in our heart. You can find actions that are neutral but the intention with which we approach them gives them a value that is positive um, or negative. And what we're working at is working in our heart to ensure that what we do is the will of God or in union with the will of God. St John of the Cross has a, a, a great saying in which he contrasts just activity and purity of heart or the interior life. And he says, let the man eaten up with activity and who imagine, uh, imagines that they are able to shake the world with their preaching and other outward works, stop and reflect a moment. It would not be difficult for them to understand that they would be much more useful to the church and more pleasing to the Lord, not to mention the good example they would give to those around them, if they devoted more time to prayer and to the exercise of the interior life. Both of the things that are there. And he says, without these, all they do amounts to nothing more than noise and uproar. It is like a hammer banging on an anvil and echoing all over the neighbourhood. So what we're doing in our heart is really something that um, affects everything uh, that we do. We've mentioned the concept of self-love, and again I stress the word inordinate. Um, we, we read a lot in our literature and things about the seven deadly sins. Well, they're not necessarily deadly sins, they're passions that can lead us into sin, but they're the things that we're, we're working with, and that's the, um, the self-love that we are trying to overcome. St. Ignatius Loyola has a wonderful saying when he says, um, um, a man's chief care ought to be turned within himself. The renunciation of self-will is a greater thing than the raising of the dead to life. Right? It might seem always oh, just getting control. But that's the thing. It is very difficult to get control. Now, The Imitation of Christ, which is a wonderful spiritual book, makes the point that we, we're concerned that we can't make other people do what we want them to do. But really, we can't make ourselves do what we want to do. That's the dilemma that we find ourselves in, and it's what we need uh, to work at. St. Francis of Assisi has another wonderful saying when he says, no one is to be called an enemy, all are your benefactors, and no one does you harm. You have no enemy except yourself. In other words, it is against ourselves that the greatest fight goes on. 
one of the spiritual writers, talks about the journey to God as it being a journey from selfishness to selflessness. In other words, from focusing around oneself to focusing around God um, and around others. Another well-known spiritual book says that um, sin is selfishness and selflessness is godliness. So they're the two things that we're, that we're contrasting. And we need um, to make that, um, that victory over our very selves. Um, the Lord himself said, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In other words, unless we are working with the denial, we're not able to take up the cross. That's what Jesus did in the garden. Father, if it be possible, let this challenge pass from me. But it wasn't something that he wanted to do. But let not my will, but thine be done. And that's the challenge um, that we have to um, um, uh, follow um, as well. There's a, another good quote from St. Thomas. He says, A great purification and Christian training of the will are necessary to obliterate all inordinate self-love. The result is produced in us by the progress of charity, which suffers man or unites man to God so that he lives not for himself but for God. So they're the things that we're, we're actually trying um, to achieve. Um, people often quote the, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, um, uh, love, peace, joy, um, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, etc. But the last one is self-control. And self-control, that fruit of the Spirit, is really what we're talking about that ability to live out what we believe within. So that the interior life is really where we need um, to work at it. Um, I had a couple of quotes there from, from the ancients, from the, the Greeks and the Latins. Um, no man is free who is a slave of the flesh. So that's a natural thing that even people who are not committed in any way to a, a religion uh, can recognise that that's important. No man is free who is not a master of himself, Epictetus, the first one was Seneca. So really, um, this is something natural, but it's something all the more important when we're trying to build a relationship um, with the Lord. Some quotes from the tradition. Self-control is the mother of spiritual health. Control your appetites before they control you. Um, it ought to be our principal object to conquer ourselves and from day to day to go on increasing in spiritual truth and perfection. But above all, it is necessary that we should study to overcome our little temptations to anger, suspicion, jealousy, envy, duplicity, vanity, foolish attachments, evil thoughts and so on. For by so doing, we shall gain strength to resist more violent temptations. That's from St. Francis de Sales. St. Francis de Sales was the first one of the great saints to write for lay people. And he, he, he focuses on the ordinary life of people. So often we focus on the big sins, as it were, but he focuses on those violations of virtue. I think I've said before that the distinction that we've made between mortal sin and venial sin has had a result that we so emphasise mortal sin that venial sin really didn't seem to matter, as it were. And what venial sin is, the violations that we're talking about here. I mean, the major things apply here too. But really, to come to a deep intimacy with the Lord, it's to live the virtues. And it's so often the virtues that we find difficult uh, to keep. And I think a lot of our people who externally are doing all the right things but if you look closely, in many ways, in the ways that are just mentioned there, um, they can find themselves uh, really not living up to the life um, of virtue. Um, I've got a few a definition um, of virtue there, which says that virtue is the habitual capacity, habitual capacity, in other words, it's something that we work to have uh, on a continuing basis, of a person to respond freely and consciously to situations in a manner that reflects and intensifies their conformity to Jesus Christ. 
In other words, that what we're, we're talking about with virtue, it's the capacity to actually live the relationship um, that we have with Jesus. A person of virtue makes the progression from knowing what is right to doing what is right. He or she intentionally chooses what to say, do and value, reaching beyond the good towards the best. In every situation, a virtuous person knows that they have an opportunity to honour the Lord and to reflect him to others. Um, we often say that we are the light of the world and we are the light of the world in the way we live. I think I mentioned in a past talk that, um, you know, just saying that we're a Catholic um, and then living our life speak and proclaim the word is really the best thing um, that we can do. Because as we live, that is what people notice. Other points are made that virtue do not just appear, we need to work um, to acquire them. First we make our habits, then our habits make us. We practice doing things, and then it becomes second nature, and we actually do those things almost, as it were, without thinking. One should not say that it is impossible to reach a virtuous life, but one should say that it is not easy, nor do those who have reached it find it easy to maintain. I have a niece that's a physiotherapist, and she talks about a muscle, and she says you lose it or use it. Well, the same applies to virtue. If you don't practice the virtue, then gradually um, it slips away from you. So these are the sort of things that, um, that we need um, to work at. Just one last quote there. To attain the promises of God, we need, above all, continuous exercise in the virtue. It's the continuous exercise. For, for however firm one's commitment to some good may be, if it is not renewed daily, it quickly dies out. So they're the sorts of things that we're talking about in, in overcoming that tension um, that exists there. I'd like to move on now to talk about how we might go about working in that area, but are there any comments or questions that we need to, to have just before we move on to the next stage? Okay. The danger of not asking questions is that I keep talking. <laughs> I'd like now just to sort of begin to talk about um, the things that we need to do if we are going um, to, to achieve that interior battle that is going on um, within us. And one of the first things we need to do is to work with our desire for God. As St. Augustine said, the whole Christian life is about desire. Um, the traditional uh, writings talk about praying always. And Augustine says, well, your desire is praying always. But if you have that continual desire for God, then that is something that will take you to God. Um, sometimes we need to define desire. Um, in, in we're dealing with the passions. We have love. We know love is reaching out to an object that we love. And the passion of joy is when we have that. Right? But when we haven't got it, the passion in the middle is desire. So the desire is love reaching out to an object that we haven't yet fully uh, possessed in the way we would like to do it. So really, what we're doing um, here is to have that desire that carries through. We, we have a saying, where there's a will, there's a way. Well, that's true, that really where there's a will to love God, then that's the thing that motivates us um, to do it. And it causes us to run to win. I think I mentioned to you um, St. Paul's attitude where he says that we're like the athlete. Only one person gets the prize, but everybody has to run to win. They don't have to win, but they have to give it their best shot. And that's really what we're doing um, when we talk about desire. When Thomas Aquinas said uh, what desire is about, you must want it, you must still want it, and you must continue to want it. In other words, the desire for the love of God stands at the very center of our life, and that's what we need uh, to focus on. I often make the point that in life, we often look to the end of life and we make sure we have what we need for the end of life. We have superannuation, and we always make sure that we're able to do what we want to do at the end of life. But if we look at life, 
in terms of eternity, and really life is meant to be looked at in terms of eternity. So it's the things that we're doing now that are going to be important, not just in the end of this life, but right into the next life as well. So that that desire, I think, is really something that is important. And when people start in the journey to God, what you're trying to do is put the desire into them. I always think in our educational system, really what we, we need to get across to people is the desire to love and reach out to God. And if we succeed in doing that, then in a sense there's something within them working to achieve what we consider um, to be um, important. So desire is really something we need to work on if we're going to uh, achieve victory in this struggle that we have. The other thing, another, another thing that we need to um, look at is intention. I mentioned intention before. Um, uh, Jesus sort of said on one occasion, I came not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. In other words, his intention in what he was doing um, was to do that. So really, we need to have always the intention of reaching out to the glory of God. Uh, in the letter to the Corinthians, uh, St. Paul um, is dealing with a, an issue in Corinth of eating meat offered to idols. And he, some people didn't want to do that. They felt it might make them identify with the idol. So St. Paul said, there's no idols, so you can eat that, eat the meat. But he said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. And who has the fact that you have a right to do it, uh, maybe that's not the thing that's going to do, give glory to God. But if our attention is always to do what is giving glory to God, sometimes our rights may not be things that we want to, um, to, to focus on. I think we live in a society that's very conscious of rights. And yet, really, it's that overall intention of reaching out to God um, that is um, the important thing. Um, there's a quote there that I just wanted to um, share with you. It was a general intention to please God in all their actions that made the primitive church such eminent instances of piety, that made the goodly fellowship of the saints and all the glorious army of martyrs and confessors. And if you will stop here and ask yourself why you are not as pious as the primitive Christians were, your own heart will tell you that it is neither through ignorance nor inability, but simply, purely, because you never thoroughly intended. You often meet people who are intending to do something, but never intending strongly enough to actually do it. We all intend to overcome our vices, but in some ways we then tend to live with the vices, and that is the thing that um, is most difficult. The next thing that I have there um, is mortification. Mortification is not a, a popular word these days, but it comes from St. Paul, and if it's in the scriptures, you can't really uh, throw it out, as it were. He says on one occasion in the letter to the Romans, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, um, you shall live. In other words, he's talking about these things that are in our life, and talking about the fact that we must mortify them. And really what mortification is about, it's about self-denial. The great weapon that we have um, in overcoming the, the inordinate self-centeredness that we have is the practice of self-denial. And as I said earlier, we wouldn't think of going for a day without prayer, but we could often go for a day when self-denial doesn't enter in. The point I'm trying to make in the talk is that they're equally important. If you only have one, you end up, as St. Teresa puts it, um, as a spiritual dwarf. So the, the mortification, the self-denial that we're talking about there, um, is something that we need to practice. Now, I think traditionally that is, um, is being talked about. We often talk about it in terms of fasting or abstinence. If we look back in our past, that all of us here would remember, we abstain from meat on Friday. And that was an act of self-denial. Now, to a large extent, that's gone by the wayside. The church still asks us to do something on a Friday. It doesn't 
specify not eating meat, but um, really other things may not achieve the act of self-denial. One of the church fathers said that um, you should fast as if you're going to live for 100 years. You should do charity as if you're going to die the next minute. In other words, there's no doubt that charity is the important thing. But if you did charity all the time and didn't ever deny yourself, you're not going to grow. So while um, it is important and it's a good thing to do acts of charity, I, I think we've lost the meaning of our self-denial on Fridays and our self-denial in Lent. Now, I'm not saying people don't do things, but I, I think the church's teaching was that it was self-denial that was um, to the very fore. And I think the other things that come in, doing good acts of charity and that, they're good things, and in some sense they're better things. But if they take away from the basic practice, which the Lord spoke about even in the scriptures, then I think we're, we're missing out on something. We're doing something good, but it's taking away from something that it really should be in our life. I think one of the great ways for us to um, deny ourselves in terms of the comfort in which we live. I think I've said before we are very, very rich compared to other countries in the world. I'm not talking about having a lot of money, but the way we live is far above the standard of many other people in the world. And you can get into a situation where unless you have your comfort, you can be very annoyed about it. You know, that uh, if the lights go out and we, we haven't got light, we sort of get a bit testy about that and complain to the government. But all of these things really are things that we can live without on a temporary basis at times. And we need to be able to sort of deny ourselves um, those things. And I think that's really one of the first areas um, that, we can, um, that we can work on. The other thing that I wanted to mention was mortification and prayer. And I'd like to quote a number of the quotes that I have on that sheet. Um, one of Francis de Sales, whom I've just mentioned, he says that um, prayer without mortification is like a soul without a body just the same as mortification without prayer is a body without a soul. So both of those things are important, and that's the point of our talk, that we're making that. Mortification and prayer are like two wings of a dove on which we may fly away into some holy treat and find our rest in God, far from the tumult of men. Birds cannot soar aloft with one wing only, so we must not think that with mortification alone and without prayer, the soul can take flight uh, that it may raise to God. So we're repeating the same thing, but it's uh, the point that needs to be made about the transformation of our life. Mortification without prayer is labor lost. Prayer without mortification is like meat without salt. It easily corrupts. And the last one there, without mortification, there is no true prayer and no interior spirit. Mortification and prayer are twin sisters who cannot be parted. If one dies, the other one likely, likewise perishes. So I think we need to look carefully at the way we are living. I think we are all people of prayer. I don't wish to deny that. But I do think that we can all look at the way um, we are exercising self-denial in our life. Another way to um, actually um, help with this interior struggle is the practice of looking into our own heart. Again, I like to look at natural situations, people who are not Christian at all. For example, uh, Plato, Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. In other words, we do need to reflect on the life that we lead. Let not sleep fall upon your eyes till you have thrice reviewed the transaction of the past day. Where have I turned aside from rectitude? What have I been doing? What have I left undone? What I ought to have done? Pythagoras, 500 years before Jesus. So you can see that it's a very natural practice to, to, to reflect on our life and actually see um, what needs um, to be done. So it's important that we do that. St. Ignatius of, Saint Lo of Loyola was certainly one of the great um, uh, saints in emphasizing examine, but really he was just picking up something that's really been there all along. 
I studied a man in the fourth century and he used to say that we should daily and hourly plough the, so the soil of the heart or till the soil of the heart with the gospel plough. In other words, we're always looking into our heart. And the early ones used to say it was like fishing in a pond. You're, you're trying to catch the big fish, as it were. That really uh, we need to be looking into our heart as in a pond and looking at what's there and trying to work with what is there. St. Ignatius distinguishes a general examine and a particular examine. The general examine is basically doing what Pythagoras did there, to look back over the day and look at um, what, um, what has taken place. He, he uses the, the, what we are to look at are things like the words and the actions um, that we've actually looked at in the day. And his point is to compare those with what they should be um, in relationship to Jesus. So it's a general examine of our life. But he also spoke about a particular examine. And his point there is that um, really we need to look at the things that are most um, injurious to, our, to the development of our relationship with Jesus. I think it's true to say we don't have all the vices. Um, some vices emerge and each of us might have our own emphases when it comes to the vices. But what Ignatius is talking about is singling out what is the, the most important obstacle that we have to our love for God? And that we begin to look at that. And he suggests that as well as having a general examine, we examine ourselves constantly, and we can do that in the evening uh, or throughout the day, about the, the particular issues. That if we are, if anger is our particular uh, problem, then we need to be looking at it and, and asking, uh, are we... Um, falling into that, and what are the circumstances in which we fall into it. And we need to work with um, the vice um, or the fault, the obstacle to intimacy with Jesus that we actually have. So examine, uh, I think, is something that's um, really important. And as um, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And sometimes you can point things out to people and they admit that they're there, they just hadn't noticed them, as it were. It's examine that raises our awareness. One of the church fathers likens growth in the spiritual life to going into a dim-lit room, and all you can see are the big pieces of furniture. But as the light grows, you see the pictures on the wall, you see the little things on the mantelpiece. In other words, as we grow, we recognise more things in our life. I think I mentioned earlier in the talks an example of a person that mentioned in confession that she was doing all sorts of violations of the virtues and she was concerned that she'd been um, a follower, a disciple of Jesus for many years and suddenly found herself in what seemed to be a terrible situation. And I had to say to her that this is a sign of growth, not a sign of falling back because she'd grown to the stage where she now recognised that these things needed attention. And that's what examine is meant to do. It's to raise our awareness so that we can actually work with those things. So um, I think sometimes people feel as they grow in the spiritual life that you know, they seem to be going backwards, but they're not going backwards, they're going forward. Sometimes they say, well, I, I, I'm on square one again. Well, they are on square, square one again, but on a different board. In other words, they're entering into a new phase of their life and it just needs to be handled in a different way. The other thing that I, I mentioned there um, that is important to help us in transforming our life um, is our lifestyle. We all have a lifestyle. You have a lifestyle to um, fulfil the duties that you have during the day. If you're interested in sport, you have a time to do your sport or time to go a club. A lifestyle is something that is there um, just out of a need in our way of living. But what we're talking about here is a lifestyle that fosters our intimacy with the Lord. In other words, um, it means that in our lifestyle we're giving a priority to those things which will help us to come closer to the Lord. And it means that we um, will avoid things in our life that may cause us to um, lose that intimacy, and I'm not talking about 
serious sin here. I'm talking about intimacy, that we're losing that deep relationship we have um, with the Lord, so that the lifestyle we have can actually help us um, to address the issues of our life. Sometimes in our lifestyle we might choose to go to a particular place or relate to a particular person knowing that that person is really a problem for us. But we're putting ourselves in the situation where we have to, may have to practice the very thing that we are trying to overcome. So lifestyle, I think, is a very important element uh, in the transformation um, of our life. Now they're the main things that I wanted to say um, I think I've perhaps said them over and over again. We're talking about the journey to God, the intimacy with the Lord, the life of prayer, prayer with a capital B, um, is a relationship with Jesus. But to have that relationship, we need individual acts of prayer that we do throughout the day in various ways, and we all have our own ones. But alongside of that, we have the practice of the virtue. And I feel personally that many people don't grow to a deeper intimacy because they don't emphasize that side as much. I'm not saying that they are not saved or anything like that, but I think that they don't reach that intimacy with the Lord, which in the long run in terms of salvation opens that up them up to a greater share in the life of Jesus, which is the way uh, our eternal glory will be determined because we share in the life of the Trinity by sharing um, in the life of Jesus. That's all that I wanted to say. Are there any comments that people would like to make or any questions? Okay. That's well, I, I don't you don't have to ask questions. <laughs> but I, I do hope that the series has been successful. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the talks are on the Vatican uh, on the Vatican, the parish website. Somebody asked about them the way I access it and I don't know whether it's the right way but on YouTube if you press the little um, search button and, and put in um, parish of Our Lady of the Dolores and then the parish website comes up so you will see the talks uh, there as I've given them and you'll also see the handouts that I've given as well. Um, Residita has been pushing me to plan something for next year so during, East, during Lent next year, we'll have three talks on the passion narr narratives of the Gospel. Of course, that's the time of preparing it. And then after Easter, we'll do something on um, uh, the Gospel of Mark, because we'll be reading Mark in the, in the liturgy um, throughout the year. And I've forgotten what was the third thing, Ms. Edita. Oh yes, I was going to um, take people through the Confessions of St. Augustine. I don't know whether you're aware of that, but not so long back, a, a publishing company in England decided to work out which were the most important books in, the, in Christian history. Mm -hmm. And the book that was first, the most important book, was the Confessions of St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. So it's a very significant book, and most of our people probably have never read it. So when we read it together, it, um, uh, it enables us to do it. And of course, um, Augustine, we know, was a great figure, and the confessions are of how he came to from a life that was not very Christian uh, to a life that was the life of a saint. Okay, well, I hope that will be of interest to you next year. So, thank you. <laughs>